I can see what's happening, and they don't have a clue. They'll fall in love, and here's the bottom line. Our trio's down to two. The sweet caress of twilight, there's magic everywhere. And with all this romantic atmosphere, disasters in the air. Can you feel the love tonight? The peace the evening brings. The In perfect harmony with all its living things, Game Go Love Podcast tonight. You'd better listen well. Game Go Love. Lots of things to tell. The Game Cola podcast is brought to you today by the Backstreet Boys, who would like to remind everybody that they're called BSB, but you don't need to emphasize the BS. The Game Cola podcast is also brought to you by Michael Gray, making references to music nobody's listened to in over 10 years. And now, back to the podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Game Cola Podcast. I'm Michael Ridgeway. I do the Quantum Geek uh, monthly column on Game Cola. Uh, I'm Michael Gray. I write um, Inside the Guide and the Ten Reasons for Game Cola. I'm Colin Greenhouch. I sometimes appear on this podcast, and that's about it. I'm Paul Franzen. I'm the editor in chief, and uh, I write Dear Readers and the Gates of Life among. A lot of other things that I do for the site. I do pretty much everything, actually. I don't know who these people are. Well, fine. Yay. You can have your own podcast. That's it for the Game Cola podcast. <laughs> we'll just let Paul do everything from now on. <laughs> Paul Franzen. Hey, Paul Franzen, Everybody what do you think about this? I think it's dumb, Paul Franzen. That's right, Paul Franzen. Is that for an hour. See, you're, you're acting like that's a bad idea, but I think that actually sounds pretty great. So. <sighs> Only he would listen to it. Yeah, and you think it would be brilliant. Yeah, it's just like, he's the only one who reads the gates of life. <laughs> oh. Actually, I'll have you know that the last article had eight votes, so that's actually a lot of readers right there. I voted, I just didn't read did. the damn article. If, does that make any sense? Not read the article, but vote anyway? I think you're just doing it to spite I, I think that's okay. I, it, yeah, you're, it's purely spiteful, so you're, you're giving Paul false hope that people are reading his column. Really, you're just going, skipping to the end. Like, yeah, I'll throw Paul a bone. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Alright, well, we'll get on with uh, tonight's topics. Uh, tonight we're going to have a, a round table kind of discussion, a la versus mode, about a couple of uh, video game related topics here. Um, first, we're going to be talking about downloadable content. And uh, secondly, we're going to be talking about the state of the video game industry and uh, how it relates to us and the media and all those types of things. Um, Colin will be our resident expert, seeing as how he is the only one here currently employed by the video game industry. Currently employed or just by the video game industry? Uh, by the video game industry. Doesn't make me oh, any sort of uh, expert, though. You're as oh. close as an expert as we have. Uh -huh. game I mean, I wanted to bring in um, <laughs> Miyamoto. Uh, but Paul's like, no, we don't have the budget for that. I was like, God damn it, Paul, I will not be constrained by your budget one more time. So the same thing when I wanted to get a TV, and the same thing when I wanted to dress a hamster up his, up his link and send it through a little maze. With a triforce at the end. We don't even have the budget for a hamster. That actually would have been pretty cool. That would have been, actually. Really, we should do that. You should do that. Paul, can I get some money to do that? But do we have a budget? <laughs> Dip into those, uh, Game Cola coffers. I've actually already um, spent our entire budget. Uh, we, I bought an ad on Facebook 
one time. It, it didn't really work. But I'm not actually making this up. <laughs> it's a, it's wow. really sad. <laughs> anyway, on to happier topics. Yeah. Uh, downloadable content. Uh, downloadable content, it is the essentially the, the practice of game companies putting out either for free or for cost, usually for cost, uh, content after a game has been released. You have the uh, most re- one of the most recent examples, the Operation Anchorage thing and the, the upcoming pit modules for um, Fallout 3. Uh, on the other hand, you have, uh, and they are for call, they are for pay, you have to, to actually send Bethesda some more money. Um, you have a lot of, you know, user created content that sometimes, it, you know, if it's an indie uh, studio, they will sell it for cheap, say on Xbox Live. Or you just have the free stuff that people do in their spare time, like with Neverwinter Nights. Um, they uh, a lot of user-created modules online that come that are made with the the, the dungeon the, the editor level editor that comes with Neverwinter Nights. So, Colin, your thoughts on downloadable downloadable content? Well, I mean, I don't think uh, PC downloadable content is anything that's uh, new at all. So I don't even know if it's worth discussing what I was um, mostly interested about is like your opinions on paying for download and stuff uh, a la for, uh, Fallout's um, which is weird because now that this is happening for the, the 360, uh, the PC users are missing out, like they're not going to get those expansions, only the 360s are um, which is kind of reversed from how it used to be, like you are saying when they were nights or any other um, like Half-Life has been modded over the, the centuries um, for free, uh, essentially. And now it's everything's becoming pay to pay to play. You know. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, if you have a PC, you can get the the like the, the Fallout stuff. I think it's all it's I'm all not it's sure Xbox. It's Xbox games for Windows, and you have uh, it's the PS3. I think is the only one left out. I mean, it's semantics at this point, but um, I just wanted to establish that. Oh, I guess you can do it on the PC. Yeah, I, I haven't tried. I know the PS3 isn't getting it at all, though. Yeah, yeah, they're the ones who are left out of this deal. What are your feelings on it uh, in general, Paul? Free versus paying for it? Uh, how do you think it should be handled? What, what do you think of it? Uh, I'm I'm generally okay with paying for it, to be honest. Uh, as long as I feel like I'm, I'm getting what I'm paying for, I don't want to pay 20 bucks to get you know a one-hour-long level right. uh, or a you know, crappy level. That would that would be bad, but I'm I mean I'm okay for I'm okay with paying for new content. I don't see any problem with that. How do you feel about something like say we we mentioned Operation Anchorage there before? It's probably about what, ten bucks for three or four hours of, hours of play. What what about uh say Little Big Planet where you're paying they give you the opportunity to pay like one or two bucks and you get some new costumes for your little sack boys and girls? Well, that that's not something I would ever do. Yeah. Uh, and it seems kind of like a waste to me. <laughs> but I know some people do. For example, uh, Game Cola senior editor Matt Gardner's been all over that stuff, for that's example. That's true, that's true. He's, he's pretty obsessed with it, actually. He's all over those sack boys. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean, I guess some people are like that. Yeah. Michael Gray, what, what do you think about downloadable content? I really, um don't have any games that do that sort of thing, so it's really not an issue for me. Mostly I just sit around and practice this voice all day long, and Uh then uh, that's what I do. It's it's a good voice. It's pretty good. It's by Jack Nicholson. Do you like it? I I can tell you've been working on it. I thought it was like some faux Canadian voice. No, but I really don't have any games that involve like downloadable content, because mostly what I do is Play old games. I've a lot of like, Nancy I've, Drew, I hear. A lot of Nancy Drew, but I've also got like sixty or so games that were made before, like I don't know, like two thousand five. That I need to get around to playing. So I really need to do that before I get around to playing games that feature downloadable content. All right. Uh, well, Colin, uh, as someone who kind of 
as first-hand experience with downloadable content, seeing as how you you worked on Guitar Heroes, uh, Guitar Hero games, and they seem to be really milking that downloadable content. What, what do you think of this? Uh, personally, I have absolutely nothing to do with any of the downloadable contents. Um, we may have something to do with some of the Wii stuff for Metallica. Yeah, you're, you're the closest by proxy. We wanted to do PS2. Yeah, I mean, we've been doing it for the PS2, which does not have downloadable stuff, so we haven't really dealt with it. Um, I hear it's a pain in the butt, though. Uh, yeah. To get sorted out sometimes. Um, I, I don't think it's a huge... I mean, it makes sense to have. Uh, I think that uh, Microsoft can be a little bit of a Nazi about it. They, I, I've heard tales of... Um, them forcing, you know, producers to charge for their their stuff even if they don't want to, um, or to charge for it for a little while and then make it free after a certain amount of time or something like that, um, which is a bit it's kind of sucky. Um, and being a PC gamer myself, I mean, I come from uh, a background where you know we can go get mods of games for pretty much free, right. and developers encur- encourage that. Um, so it's it's difficult to. I mean, I've I've paid for downloadable content. I paid for Operation Anchorage. Uh, I think it's worth it for stuff that adds extra storyline and that like a production company has actually spent a decent amount of time, you know, working on and weaving into their previous tale. Um, stuff that's uh, purely aesthetic. I think I I personally find it harder. F- to justify to myself to buy, you know, I'm like Paul was saying he doesn't do it, but uh, but other people do, and I, there's some stuff that I've been kind of wanting to, but you know, just I don't feel like I should because of the money I can spend on other stuff. But um, I think uh, the biggest concern that can be uh, is somewhat true is perhaps it's milking it essentially a lot like the. Guitar Hero and Rock Band franchise. I mean, you do get, you know, an extra three songs for however much you pay, but uh, they're doing it every week, so I mean, they must be making a, a lot load off of it. Um, and I mean, other, there are other companies, I think, too. I think EA has been rather bad with the way they distribute downloadable content, where a lot of the stuff that you seem to be paying for is stuff that is in the game or should have been in the game, mm-hmm. and they're just kind of tacking it on. Mm-hmm. Um, which is uh, personally, I think, not great. You know. I mean, do you, do you have more of a? Is your objection more, you know, on ethical grounds than that? It's just if you pay for a game, they should give you the game, not say, not like try and break it up into little chunks. Um. Yes, I think people need to. I, I think there's a lar- There's a big difference between say, like, Fallout 3 and what they added for how much you pay for it, which is extra content and more storyline and more game hours um, compared to, um, say, like, Halo. Uh, you can pay, you know, 10 bucks for a map pack that comes with, like, I don't know, 15 maps, maybe probably even less than that, um, which I think, you know, they could have distributed for free. It's just yeah. a map. It's not like someone spent a lot of time craft. I mean, there was someone, obviously, who crafted it, but it wasn't like woven into a storyline or it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a uh, super huge deal, but they still charge about the same comparatively with the Fallout add-on, which that, I think that is kind of milking it. I think that goes to the extreme. Well, see, I've heard people that would come with that argument by saying that a map pack, you get it, you know, you, you play that, you can play that over and over and over and over again. Whereas with Operation Anchorage, because it's, you know, a story related uh, story related element you're probably only going to go through that once or twice whereas if you're heavy on the multiplayer that map pack is going to get a lot of use um I agree with that I mean it probably comes down to a question of your preferences and, and what you are going to use it I, I understand that but I still think it, it becomes um you know I'd rather spend ten dollars on an extra hour of, of storytelling and um crafted, you know, areas that I guess they really don't necessarily add to the game, but, you know, it's just something extra to do, and I guess that is a personal opinion, I mean yeah. it doesn't make it any better or less yeah. Paul, Michael, thoughts? Um, 
I just remembered that the Nancy Drew folks actually have a downloadable game that you could pay for. I think it's like five or ten bucks for a, a game they have. I haven't bought it. That really doesn't add much to the conversation. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Michael Gray didn't buy an they online game. It's like... <laughs> I see. That's. I guess that's what I think about uh, downloadable content is buying a game online for me would be. For me, that would be the same as downloadable content. Mm-hmm. I just don't buy, just buy games uh, online, period, I guess. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it's, so it's, 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 kind of, it's a moot point for you, really. Yeah. Would you pay for downloadable content of stuff, Michael? I guess it would depend on the stuff. I don't know. I mean, a couple, two weeks ago, there was a... Four weeks ago, you guys had the Mega Man podcast. Would you pay for the extra content that was on... Mega Man Wii, which one was like a time trial mode, I think, or like an impossible mode or something. Yeah. And then the other one was pretty much uh, you get to pick uh, you get to pick one of the other characters. Proto Man. Who? You get to play the game as Proto Man. Uh, which does that alter the gameplay at all? Does anyone know? Um, I meant to uh, get a hold of it. I never did. I don't think I'd pay for it. I wouldn't pay for Mega Man 9 anyway. Yeah, I'm with you on that, actually. You wouldn't pay for Mega Man 9? I, I would not. Well, no. I didn't pay for Mega Man 9, so that is a statement. I, I can't beat any of the Mega Man games without dying. You see, my death chart was like 70, over 70 deaths per game. And with Mega Man 9, I wouldn't have safe states, so I'd be even worse at it. So you don't you don't pay for it because of your voice. Well, Paul, did I did I hear you say that you would not pay for Mega Man Nine? Oh yeah, I, I was just gonna say uh, I I wouldn't pay for it just for the for the same reason that Michael Gray wouldn't. Uh, oh, okay. In fact, I think he's probably better at Mega Man than I am. Uh, okay. Um, I couldn't beat I couldn't beat the demo of Mega Man Nine. So it's not only so. like moral uh-uh. obje- uh, grounds that you object to. Oh, you know, no, it's it's it's. it's Okay. I was going to say, like... It's it, just it, taste. It's just taste. Cause, you know, some people would look at Mega Man 9 and say, oh, well, it's, it's 8-bit, you know, it's, it's it's little. I can download... Oh, I think that's awesome. I think they should make more 8-bit oh, games. I, I think too. that look that was, that was the one reason I played the demo. Yeah, I, I, I was curious if that was sort of your reasoning there. Because I, I have heard some Oh, no, no, no. I, well, you know, they're making it this old game. Why would I want to play that? Why would I want to keep so. Yeah, but those people are idiots. So. They they are true. We don't listen. Yeah. Um, but I will say though, what what did, what did you say the uh, the downloadable modes were for Mega Man? Uh, it was like a, a time trial mode time or something. Time trial, like insane difficulty. You could download the ability to become uh, play as Proto Man. Um, and these those you had to pay for those. I yeah. I think those probably should have been included in the game to begin with. Maybe not the Proto Man thing. I don't know. But I, I agree that the other mode. Yeah, those are extra things that I've seen put into other games. Yeah. I mean, do you think there should be sort of an industry-wide standard for what you can have as episodic content and what you can... Uh... Wow. That's an interesting idea, but I don't think anybody would figure out how to enforce it. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, if anything, the, the consumer is going to... It's going to fall to the consumer to enforce it, uh, if anybody... So just by saying, like, and, and people always it. buy this stuff, don't they? Yeah. Didn't they buy the uh, the horse armor from Oblivion or whatever that was? Oh yeah, I, which is ridiculous. I think I actually heard that that was like a top seller for the company. Really? Well, I mean, you you, you get people addicted to your game; they're gonna pay for every little scrap they can get. Well, moving on. Um, what do you think? What do you guys think this holds for the future of the video game industry? Are, are we going to see um, a time where basically every video, all video game content becomes sort of episodic? You know, they'll release, say, I mean, the extreme case would be, you know, a company working on a game and not actually shipping the entire game; they ship it, say, a level at a time. Are we talking about like, uh, you know, the new Sam and Max games? Where uh, they actually just did break it up into six parts and they released one, you know, every few months. Say even before it's it's done, you know, you have uh, 
say they get done level one of the of the new game and say, okay, well we're shipping this out and they start working on level two. I think I would have a problem with that just because I I wouldn't want to start playing the game not knowing if it was ever going to be finished or not. Uh, yeah, true. Because that would be kind of a bummer yeah. if they didn't. I mean, to not to, not to the full extent of that, but that is happening. I mean, games now are being released before they are fully uh, finished or attested to a full degree. I mean, uh, Killzone just came out. Killzone 2 came out last Friday. Um, not long. Well, Last Friday, I don't remember, um, but it's has just got a patch today, you know, and that's right out the gate, less than a week. Yeah. Um, for some from some things that probably had been tested and had uh had been bugged but haven't been haven't gone through, or you know, I think companies um with these new hard drives and now expecting everyone to have uh, internet playability really do rely on that to, you know, maybe get a game out the door a little bit faster than they could have back in PlayStation Day. Um, so, I mean, that that's a problem that is already occurring. I mean, not to the full extent of only parts of games getting released, but right. um, it's something that I, I think is rather negative of the, the Internet. It, it's troubling. The console situation. I remember Neverwinter Nights 2, and when that when I bought that game, it was it was not complete, um, simply because of all the, the the bug issues with it. A lot of the armor and weapons, and you know, some even some dialogue was left out. And now, if you play that game, it is uh, completely different uh, because you know they had a chance to go through and patch everything. Um, and that I mean that troubles me by the fact that I can buy a game on the first day. But, you know, I might have to wait a month or two to actually be able to play it and fully enjoy it. I mean, again, this is something that's all, that's been happening for the PC for a really long time. I mean, mm-hmm. um, I think they're, they've are they been better about it, and I think gamers expect there to be patches for the PC. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I can't condemn it on, off the bat, because, you know, it does happen. And I'm sure there are PlayStation games or Nintendo 64 games that have gone out and developers have gone, man, I wish I could just fix this real quick and how to do it, but it just doesn't get into the game. Um, so, I mean, it is it is also a good thing. It is, I could see that, yeah, I mean, I could see that, I could see it can be used in a negative sense as well. Mm-hmm. With, with regards to the episodic content, I mean, I'm not entirely against, you know, say games like Santa and Max being released that way, or uh, the, the Panier K game being done episodically, because they, they do it in a nice, good chunk. My fear is that, you know, it, it's going to progress to smaller chunks, and then you're going to have that as an industry-wide standard. Well, I wouldn't, I'm not actually sure I would, I would describe the Sam and Max games as being in, in nice, good chunks. Each game was only a, a few hours long, if I recall. I actually did wish that they had, if they, uh, that they had been significantly longer than they really? were. And granted, you weren't paying full price for them, but they were really short. And that actually hurts uh, the adventure game genre in general. I think the, uh, yeah. the length of the game, because they're they're. I mean, <laughs> this is getting a little too specific, but I mean, there were things like there weren't since it was so short. There weren't that many different items in the game, so there were only so many different ways you could solve each puzzle. So it made it a lot easier to solve each puzzle mm. because there weren't that many options. That's a shame. It's still a really good game, though. Everyone should buy it because it was really yeah. funny. <laughs> I've actually never <laughs> played one, so I've been meaning to. Did, did you, you didn't even play the original? No. I didn't have a PC back then. Oh. Yeah. Does the game have anything to do with Abraham Lincoln? One of them does, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. So I read one. Of, I read your uh, review of the game that has to deal with Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, I, if I recall... Um, Not really. I just saw the picture <laughs> while I was skimming through the review. Well, <laughs> My article, but still, I believe they they animate the uh, the statue of Abraham Lincoln in D.C. and then he runs for president. Oh, cool! Yeah, and then uh, and then later they they spoiler alert, uh, Sam and Max destroy Abraham Lincoln, and uh, the Abraham Lincoln's head, stone head, becomes a character in the next season, and uh, he has a love interest and things like that. What? <laughs> Mary Todd is the only woman for Abraham. (laughs) 
She um, went insane after he died. That's how devoted she was to him. Well, apparently Abe got over her pretty quickly. Oh. After his death. Oh, okay. So Well, well she's dead, I guess. Just continuing on, I mean, does anyone have any final thoughts on what they think the... Uh, what downloadable content holds for the future of the video game industry? I think you're going to see, I mean, downloadable content, downloadable distribution is going to be, I think it's going to be very big. Um, yeah. I mean, independent developers, that's the only way they can get their game to be even heard of at all. Uh, like Steam and a couple of others. Um, uh, there's, there's one that the Penny Arcade guys set up, Greenhouse, I believe. Um, it's, that's, I mean, that's the only way you're going to get to see independent titles come out. And with independent titles, you are going to probably get shorter, shorter games that are, you know, either, um, have expansions. Like, like the Salmon Max is a good example of, um, uh, periodical games. I think it's going to, I think it, stuff like that is going to occur more, maybe not on the scale of Salmon Max. Like, I understand where Paul is coming from in that it is a shorter adventure game and that, that is kind of like a no-go for an adventure game. Is I mean, what you're paying for is the longevity of it and the, the complication of it. Um, but I think the Seven Max series is a lot more of like just an interactive novella, essentially. It, it's even called Seasons. Not they're not necessarily games anymore. Well, they are, but you know, um, it's just more of a way to tell the story. But I think games like like the way Half Life's going. Um, I think they're having a particular problem with it because uh, I think Valve is used to a time schedule of eh, when it's done, it's done, and here's what you're going to get. So they're taking a really long time on their episodes. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, they've been quality stuff when they come out, and they've been a lot of content. Like, it's almost a new game. Um, right. Which is which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I've, I've enjoyed the, um, the Half-Life episodes, but then again, I played them all on... Uh, the orange box, and I have to ask myself, would I have enjoyed them as much if they were not on the orange box together? If I had, you know, if they, had, if they were spaced out. Like if you had been waiting for them since they had yeah. too? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess, I mean, that's something about episodic content that uh, is good for companies, I guess, is that if they've got something to attract late buyers. Like, if you were never interested in the Half-Life series... So you didn't pay for it for sixty bucks back in the day. You're still going to get you know sixty bucks out of you because you're willing to pay for it now that it's got two extra episodes. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, uh, mm-hmm. moving on, I just want to touch on this really quick too. Um, similar to downloadable content, uh, purchasable downloadable content WTF. Yeah, downloadable content WTF. But, uh, purchasable, uh, unlock codes. Say, you know. It's crap. It's crap. WTF. It's crap. The end. I think that does warn a WTF. Um, <laughs> I miss my game genie. The end. <laughs> I will, uh, I will confess. Well, I'm kind of alright. I, I think, you know, there, there are different types of gamers. And there are people who don't have the time to go through and say, is it every little last looking for any other game? And they just they they want to be able to have say an ex this extra option or this extra gun or whatnot, and so they're willing to pay for it. While I would not personally do it, you know, if if they're willing to to plunk down the cash, that's fine. Now that said, I believe it would be uh, unethical for a game company to you know have paying for it be the only option to unlock it. If you're going to include it all on the same disc, you damn well better give me the chance to unlock it myself. That's how I feel. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. I understand where um, Paul's coming from with, you know, it has been in the past just a code you put in. But I mean, there are a lot of games that don't have that and you actually have to unlock it. Or go out and buy a Game Genie or you know, a Game Shark or what have you. Um, do, do they still I, I make Game Genies or Game Sharks? Does anyone know? I, I don't think no. so. Do they still yeah. exist? Because I kind of miss them a lot. Well, see, I I think I'd rather give my money to the company that I bought the game from to get all the secrets. Yeah. Cheat that way, you know. 
Um, I think they were eaten. They were eaten by uh, some other company that now makes a bunch of uh, peripherals. If that's anything, mm-hmm. they got eaten by one of those companies that like make extra controllers for games and that sort of stuff. That's what happened to the game Shark Company. Well, that's terrible. It seemed to die yeah. out uh, around the well, with the N64, I think. Right? No. Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't think we really saw them that much with uh, disc-based consoles, right? It actually, I think that's kind of when they stopped this thing. I'm yeah. looking at the Wikipedia page. It says they have Game Sharks for the Wii, PS3, and the uh, they don't they don't have the 360. Yeah, it really. I'm yeah. looking at the web page and they have the 360 on it. Yeah, uh, oh, I'm looking at the Wikipedia. It says it's uh, huh. prohibited by Microsoft licensing. Well, I've never seen one in the store. Neither have I. Yeah, I, well, that goes to show. I mean, how yeah. how many people use them anymore? Or, yeah, I mean, you can just yeah. go online and you know find the codes to do whatever. Especially you want. with the, especially with the creation of you know hard drives where they save the save states. I mean, you could go put your SD card into a into a uh, computer and download a save state for any Wii game and automatically have everything unlocked already. Mm-hmm. I would imagine the same goes for the 360 and the. PS2, you can put a USB thing into, so, PS3. Well, that wraps up the first part of our discussion. We'll be back with the second half after a very special message from Michael Gray. (laughs) Michael, what's going on? Are you crying? Oh, hey, Steve. Yeah, I'm just crying because, well... You see, the Game Cola podcast tonight, it was all about downloadable content, and I've never downloaded anything in my life! (laughs) But Michael, it's your birthday party! You shouldn't be in here crying, you should be out having a good time! (laughs) Well, Steve, you're right, except for one thing! It's my party, and I'll cry if I want to, cry if I want to, cry if I want to! You would cry too if it happened to you. And now back to the podcast. Well, uh, moving on to our next big topic: um, the state of the video game industry uh, and how media and consumer expectations are related to that. Uh, the game industry is still going pretty strong. It's been hurt recently uh, because of the recession, but you know, everything's hurting. Um, but it's it's an industry that's had a, a lot it's caught a lot of flack over the years. I mean, it's essentially the modern equivalent of the comic book industry in the 1950s. Unfortun- or fortunately, um, it doesn't have the same economic impact, but at least from a social stand, uh, standpoint, the video game industry has been kind of a whooping boy, in my, at least in my uh, opinion. Um, again, Colin, as the only one of us actually employed by the video game industry, um, what are your thoughts on these issues? Um, I mean, the economy is obviously affecting the video game industry with all the layoffs happening. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think the major corporations in video games, specifically like EA, Activision, Sony, uh, Microsoft, have this idea that, um, I I guess you should put Nintendo in that, but I don't don't think they have this idea, but I I I feel like a a common conception now is to find companies that are flailing in this economy and just snap them up Mm -hmm. and um, use them as kind of just cheap labor, which is unfortunate. and I think you lose, I think with the way the economy is going, you lose a lot of potentially uh, new and innovative, that buzzword, uh, titles to come out. Uh, mm. No one really wants to take a risk. Uh, a risk. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you can obviously see that the economy is affecting uh, the game industry. Uh, I'd, I'd imagine you guys are feeling it too. Like, how often do you actually go out and buy a game these days um, with the price of them and the amount of money? I, I've actually 
picked I've actually purchased more than usual in the last few in the last month or so, for the truth. I mean before that I was I was I was cutting back. Um fairly new releases. You wish. Did you buy them at release price? <laughs> no. I usually buy them through Gamefly. No well, no wait, let me think. I got Valkyrie Chronicles through Gamefly. I bought Neverwinter Nights 2, the latest expansion from from Best Buy. And, okay, if, essentially, if it's not a PC game, I got it from got it through Gamefly. I bought it through them. So I am a shill. I am sorry, Colin. I am stealing money from you. No, no, no. I mean, I I can't complain about that. I I use games myself. Yeah. Um. I don't go to GameStop. Yeah, I think GameStop's... I think that is more of a shill than... Yeah. Um, so at least when you buy a used game from Gamefly, used means they paid for a full price and have rented it to people. Yeah. And now they're making money out of it. Whereas, you know, GameStop, someone bought a game that morning, came in and traded it in that afternoon, and suddenly they're selling it for five bucks less and calling it used. Mm. I just don't like how GameStop still charges like 20 bucks for every Game Boy Advance game. I just don't like GameStop. <laughs> um, oh. but go- going back to the, the, the industry itself, um, obviously Paul and Michael uh, and myself don't have as much direct experience, but um, Paul, what, what are your thoughts on the state of the video game industry? Are you hopeful for it? Are you optimistic? Or is there anything you'd really like to see it do? Mm. Ooh, the mock train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would be okay with that, I think. Um, I don't know, I kind of feel like we're going to see, a, we already see a lot of sequels and franchises right now, but I kind of feel like it's going to be happening even more and more and more now because I don't think there are as many people wanting to risk their money on a game that they don't know if it's, if it's going to be any good or not, or if they're going to like it. So I, I just because of the economy and, and how nobody wants to spend money in general. So I, th- I think moving forward, we're going to see that even more than we are right now, which it's already kind of bad right now. Yeah, I, I've heard. Uh, I've read and stories already to that effect yeah. as well. Uh, Michael Gray, your thoughts? You know, the movie industry, if you think about Hollywood, they haven't come up with anything original in the past 30 years, and they seem to be doing okay. So I think the video game industry can live right. That's that's a decent point, actually. That's all I have to think about. I I don't think that the... I mean, video games aren't going anywhere. Um, I think the main concern is uh, what games you're getting from this, and I think, especially, I, you guys are, all of us are commenting on the game industry and games that are coming out and writing reviews about games, and I think mm-hmm. that the expectations for games are coming to a, you know, a pinnacle, essentially, because, I mean, I think a lot of people expect way too much out of everything that they, you know, that they've been getting. Um, I mean... Great titles like like Mirror's Edge did not sell very well because it wasn't you know whatever people wanted it to be. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, if it's not what people want so it to be, is right that now are, hey, sorry? Oh, I've gone. Well, if it's not what people want it to be, I mean, is is that it, it? Almost sounds like it, it, the way you're saying it, it's the fault of the consumer. It was a great game, but they didn't buy it. But, I think it's, I don't, I'm not going to blame the consumer here, but I think the consumer and the media, the people that are accepting these games, um, I think they have too high, ex- too high expectations for, for games. And I mean, I understand how people are being more conscious of where they're dropping, you know, 60 bucks for a new release, mm-hmm. um, because of the economy uh, on one part, but I also think that, you know, um, there's a lot of, just you know, crap floating around in the industry right now. It's not. It's not bad. I don't. I don't uh, want to say that it's crap. I guess, but I mean, like the the amount of games that are you know shovelware, they're just mm-hmm. thrown out the door to get people to, to buy for that system, and the amount of games that are 
either sequels or, you know, movie tie-ins or not their own intellectual property outweighs, like, you know, 10 to 1 the amount of games that are new, um, original, I interesting IPs that um, kind of get brushed under. And I think the most, pro I mean, the most prominent one recently has been uh, Mirror's Edge. That's a pretty big one. Um, there's not a lot of other games that I can think of that are something new um, that have been, you know, even that popular. And that didn't do so well according to, you know, the numbers. Well, Colin, you just said the most intelligent thing we've had in this podcast, I think. <laughs> That's what we call you our expert. Sorry to be so serious, guys. No, it, it's good. Uh, it's I, great, actually. Uh, it's like, well, I, I got nothing. <laughs> Colin said that very <laughs> eloquently, and and and, and uh, well, uh, so that's good. I mean, uh, I'm not, I'm not noticing this as someone who works on games. I'm noticing this as someone who buys games. Like the last games that I bought have all been sequels. Or Hell yeah. uh, not even sequels necessarily. Like I don't know if you could call Fallout 3 a sequel. It's just has a Fallout title and has the feel. Yeah. Um, so I guess it is somewhat of a new game but it's still, you know, um, the only reason it's sold so well I'm, in part is because it has a Fallout name attached to it. So I think you're going to I think you're going to see less games I mean, it's harder to, to come up with something that is going to have that name recognition. Like, I mean, there's never going to be, like, uh, the year 2000, uh, the, the decade 2000, um, Mario, for example. Like, there's not going to be, I can't imagine there being a game that has, like, three or four titles in the next couple of years, other than games that are already doing that, like Guitar Hero, that are just milking it, and... You know, like that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, that's that's just me as a consumer. Like you got, I, I'd imagine you guys might feel the same way about games like Guitar Hero, or yeah. like you know. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're obviously excited about Final Fantasy, like I am, but I'm excited about it because it's a Final Fantasy game, not because it's anything new or you know. I mean, it's yeah. going to be a new storyline, but it could be utter crap. And the only reason I'm excited about it is it's because it's got that name attached to it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Could be other crap. Could be. A Final Fantasy game could be crap. Well, we, nice. we, won't, we won't get into Michael Gray's loathing for Final Fantasy. Have you played any of them besides six, Michael Gray? What? Yeah, Have I remember I played the... Uh, I've linked to your uh, review of Final Fantasy that, 1 and 2 for the Game Boy Advance like 50 times. Say. <laughs> Because it's like yeah. the best review ever and completely sums up the entire game. Well, that that game is is pretty much awful. I can't really say yeah. anything about it. I, I did like 7, though. 1 and 7 are actually the only ones I've played so far. I haven't played 7. It's pretty good. Graphics are, uh, they, they're, they're kind of painful, but it's good. if you can get past that, it's cool. Uh, <laughs> seven, seven, seven <laughs> um, it's no Chrono Trigger. But I, I I like nine. I like six and I like nine. I like four. Moving on. Uh, well, well, we'll just close with one. Uh, with the issue of how the media and society as a whole views the video game industry. Yeah. It's getting better. I think. Uh, historically, it's it's generally been kind of negative. You know, like I said before, the video game industry industry has been sort of a whipping boy for society's ills. Uh, it's like, oh, well, our kids are violent, well, it must be video games. Our kids are sexually explicit, or, or they're sexual, uh, or they're using whoa, whoa, sexual whoa, violence. Uh, I, I don't, I, I don't know how to describe kids getting into carnal relations early. I don't know. But you, basically, anything, you know, wrong that happens with children is the fault of video games. that damn Juno movie, that's what it is. Yeah, that's true. And it's um, Zach Rich's fault, too. It is. You could just put an ice cube on it. Things would be okay. Ice cube? What? That's what my dad said. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, um... What are you supposed to say? I have no idea what you're talking about, Michael Gray. Right? Yeah. Um, anyway, um... I think the argument about who's... 
responsibility it is to uh, keep your kids from, from fornicating is nothing to do with video games. Whatsoever. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't sure exactly what I was trying to say. That, but yeah. Well, I, I was thinking of, I don't you think know, anybody's... Uh, I, I was specifically thinking of the hot coffee pot for uh, Grand Theft Auto. Right. right. Re, uh, uh, Andreas. San Andreas. <laughs> And, you know, people were saying, oh, well, it's going to incite our children to engage in sexual acts, and it, it's, you know, showing them terrible things. And really, it was just a crappy mini game with a guy and a girl and square boobs. That the kids had to go out of their way to find, anyway. Right, and exactly. It's not like the, 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 the children are completely innocent here. <laughs> they had to hack into the game to get that, so... Right. But it's, it became one of the, you know, the rallying cries for uh, those looking to censor video games, along with, you know, uh, graphic uh, depictions mm-hmm. of violence, uh, or even not so graphic depictions of violence, uh, and you know, the cursing yeah. that you see in, in modern games and stuff like that. Do you think it's ever, do you guys think it's ever going to go away? Do you think it's going to, there, there's going to come a day when people are going to, say, respect the content in video games the same way they respect the content in movies? Or it's like, well, this is this obviously has inappropriate themes in it, but, oh, it's rated R, so that means I should not be a dumbass and take my child to go see it. I was just going to say, I, th- I think uh, I think we'll start seeing that kind of thing uh, soon, very soon, uh, with our generation, a generation who's actually grown up playing video games, being the ones having children and having to make these kind of decisions, because... Mm-hmm. I think our generation is much, much more educated on, you know, things like the ESRB and, and whether a game is going to be appropriate for somebody or not. Whereas uh, I think the, the adults right now tend to not have any clue what they're talking about. And I say adults, I mean, I'm, I'm almost, I'm sort of an adult, I, I guess, technically. <laughs> but um, I'm talking about old people. Right there, any day now, Paul, don't. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm talking about old people. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm talking about you. There's no difference. <laughs> I'm still young. <laughs> oh, I'm old. Yay. Uh, no, keep, keep talking. Oh, I completely lost what I was saying now. Um, well, you're saying that because uh, we're the generation that's been raised on video games, so we're having kids right now because video games warped our minds into having sex uh, at the age of four. So That's, that's a pretty good summary. Yeah. Uh, uh, so we'll do a better job than our parents did. Is basically what you're saying? I think we will have a much better idea of, of yeah, like like I said, of, of whether games are appropriate or not. We won't have to rely on the video game companies themselves policing themselves because we'll be able to look at a game box and say, oh, this game's rated M. Maybe I should not buy it for my six-year-old, you yeah. know? Because a lot of people apparently have trouble with that right now. Yeah, I still think, I still think too... People are going to be a lot harsher critic on the video game industry um, because it's an interactive experience. Um, you can't go to a movie about, um, you know, a movie. Say there's a movie, a Grand Theft Auto movie. You can't go to and watch that movie and get anything more than what they give you. Whereas if you're playing the GTA game, you could, you know, slaughter thousands of people with a chainsaw if you want to. You know, it's thought that was all you did so, in those games. <laughs> well, it is, but I was using it as an example. So, I mean, you should expect that while playing a GTA game, but uh, the user has the free will to show that they are psychotic. And I think that terrifies people. Um, even though mm-hmm. it is just virtual reality, it doesn't necessarily transfer to life in, in any way whatsoever. The interactive aspect of it, I mean, does frighten some people, but at the same time, the... Uh... I think I'm pretty staunch on the camp that it is the parents' um, responsibility to monitor what, what you know their children are doing. Uh, uh, it's the same for TV. It's the same. It absolutely is. Um, I, I one of the, my, my new favorite story is about the parents who uh, have been taking their children to go see the Watchmen movie, and you know end up storming out in the huff half an yeah. hour in. Because, like, oh, I thought this was going to be, like, a Spider-Man or Iron Man. No. First off, it's rated R. Secondly, do a little research. Um, I think that's the responsibility of the parent. 
Uh, the same thing goes for video games. Um, it goes for anything you know your child is mm-hmm. going to pick up. Uh, books, a comic, uh, yeah. uh, a movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And when you're a parent, you're going to totally disagree with everything you said just now. <laughs> when your kid screws up, you are not going to try to take it, take responsibility for that. Yes, I am. Mm-hmm. Well, when his kids screw up, it won't be because he bought violent video games for him, because he will have known not to do that. If my kid's not playing violent video games, why will his kids screw up? When when will his kids screw up because they screwed up, and not just Michael Ridgeway? He was a bad parent. He took them to see bad movies, play bad video games. My kids are going to screw up as it is. That's what they're going to do. Now, I mean, if they really screw up, I'll just blame Michael Ridgeway. That's what I'm saying. But you Um, can't always blame the parents for everything. Well, I I, kids are going to screw up. They are going to screw up. But well, I, th- I think the I point think is, is that you can't blame the video game industry for it. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. The, right. the, the children, yeah, the kids. Yeah, that, that, that was more of my point. Not completely, anyway. You can't blame the video game industry. Yeah. yeah. You can't blame the video game industry more than you can blame anything else right. your any child comes into contact with. Yeah. That includes school, that includes parents, that includes TV, that includes radio, that includes books. Do you think that's ever going to kind of sink into society, or...? I think there's always going to be stupid enough people who will complain and blame anything but themselves, um, yeah. unfortunately. Whether or not it dies down for the video game, I, I agree with Paul that parents will become a lot more aware of what their what their um, kids are playing, um, because it's something that they might find interest in, um, or have found interest in in the past. Um, but there, I, there's still going to be idiots in the world, and you can't stop that. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a dead issue in, like, 20 years or so after the total collapse of the, our civilization. Mm-hmm. And we're fighting off zombies with uh, fire extinguishers. Right. Well, well no, it's, a, it's how history repeats itself. We're, we're just like the uh, Romans after the Golden Era. We're just crap, and we're going to be destroyed. Yeah. That can happen to the Greeks. History repeats itself. We're gonna die. I, I think we're gonna start to really have trouble when a, a army of Michael Gray clones comes from outer space to attack the world. You guys will have trouble. I won't. <laughs> his, uh, his, his DNA is floating around somewhere up in space, so who knows what's gonna happen to it. It's a terrifying thought. Me and Stephen Colbert clones. Yay. Oh man, army of Stephen Colbert. Be a terrifying I, I would lay my life down for that. I guess that's uh that's about all we had to discuss here. A little bit more intellectual this time instead of just myself and Michael Gray arguing or myself and Zach Rich arguing or myself and myself arguing. Uh I like the sound of my own voice. But uh yeah, I hope we gave people some stuff to think about. Um this has been uh Michael Ridgeway, Paul Franzen, Michael Gray, and Colin Greenhall. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. he's gone, and it's totally over. Now and he's gone, and it's over, it's over. Now and it's over, it's over, it's over. Now I can see myself. Uh, hey, Mom. It's ready, huh? Thank you. Are you at your thing? Yes, I am. Hi, Jake. Am I on the... <laughs> Mom, let's shut the door now. <laughs> we put that one in there. Oh, that's, that's definitely staying in the podcast. <laughs>